Thanks, guys. So um, we recently launched the Fantastic Beast VR experience at Framestore, and it was the debut experience on Google's um, uh, Daydream platform. And uh, what I'm going to share with you today is a little bit more of a behind the scenes. I'm actually not even going to share with you the case study video, because a lot of case study videos are always the glitz and the glamour. And what I'm going to share with you is a lot of the pain and the tears about the realities of making something like Fantastic Beast VR. And in the hope that some of you can take away some of the things that we've learned um, in the kind of past four years of making VR experiences, so that when you go away to make some of your own VR experiences, you can pick up some of the things that we've, uh, all the things that we failed at. Um, so hopefully it gives you kind of a head start into this medium. So just a little bit about Framestore. So Framestore has actually been going on for 30 years. Um, they are, we are a visual effects studio, and we've created some of the most uh, amazing kind of visual effects for films, everything from Dobby and Harry Potter to Guardians of the Galaxy. Um, and we kind of won the Oscar for Gravity. So Gravity really put Framestore on the map, but they've been around for a long time. Now, we kind of delved into the world of VR about kind of four years ago when the team received the first DK1 headset. Um, and we were very lucky enough at the time to be working with HBO, and we created the Game of Thrones Ascend the Wall experience. And what happened in terms of that experience, we took it on the Game of Thrones world tour and the team did not expect the reaction that they received from people coming out of VR. Multiple people, time over time, were blown away, not only by the technology, but what, how it made them feel. And so we dedicated a whole VR studio to exploring this medium and working out what the hell it all means and how do we create, how do we create experiences that kept giving people those goosebumps? How do we create experiences that kept giving people that excitement and energy? And so since 2014, we've built this dedicated team. And you know, we've been very lucky enough to work with some amazing brands across all of the sectors, everything from turning you into a, an Avenger in the Marvel's VR experience to uh, going on a virtual hike. And at the time we did the Merrill experience, we were using a 20-foot-long mocap system. And a few months after that experience, HTC Vive launched. So you can tell how the developers were a little bit like, damn, why didn't that come out a little bit earlier? And then more recently, our field trip to Mars experience, where we took a group of school kids on an ordinary school bus and we transported them onto Mars. Um, and it was kind of off the back of doing the field trip to Mars and everybody in the team were kind of a little bit like, we may need a holiday, that we got a call from Warner Brothers saying that there's a brief and it's to work with J.K. Rowling on her new movie, Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I'm a total Harry Potter fan. I have two boys. So working on this was literally a dream come true. So our challenge in the experience was how do we take something that is one part of the Rowling world, but a completely new story. So Harry Potter doesn't feature in Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. This is actually set before Harry Potter's time. So how do we introduce this story? Why do we even need to use VR? And what would be the narrative in VR? And how could we make something on a new platform, on a Google Daydream platform, that actually had a controller? How could we use interactivity on a mobile device in a way that had never been done before? So we were faced with a number of challenges, and these are just three of those that I'm going to take you through today. Um, there's probably like 20 challenges, and if anyone wants to kind of come and grab me afterwards, I'm more than happy to take you through them. But three that I think are going to be import important for everybody to think about and take away is, how do we expand the story from the movie? A lot of VR today is duplicating what you see on other mediums, but the best type of VR is something that could only have been done in this medium. If it could be done on a YouTube ad, if it could be done as a TV, if it could be shot as a commercial, then that's where it should exist. Only use VR when it is the ultimate medium to deliver what you're trying to do. And then how do we build for an entirely new platform <laughs> when we didn't even have the headset in our hand? And then finally, how do we maintain the visual quality when you're working with someone like Warner Brothers and Fantastic Beasts? How do we create creatures in VR that feel believable and real? So we had a few challenges on our hand. Um, so let's take the first one. How do we extend the story from the film? So this was the really fun part. 
The first thing that we actually did is our visual effects supervisor at Framestore, that's Christian Manns on set with JK Rowling, who looks very serious. Um, Christian Manns, not so serious. Uh, super great guy. We got onto the phone. Um, they were on set. They were shooting at the time. And the first thing we said to them, I said, Christian, tell me, tell me about the script, tell me about the story, and tell me what assets you have. We literally did not have a lot of time to, one, deliver the experience, and two, to get down on set and shoot anything. He kind of rambled on about the story and the script, which was great. And he then came to this moment where he said, well, there's a wizard in the story. And this wizard has a suitcase. And when he places a suitcase on the floor, the suitcase pops open and you transport it to this magical world. And instantly at that given moment, we didn't need to script anything else. We didn't need to pitch anything else. We knew that that's why we would use VR. We wanted to give everybody the opportunity to become Newt Scamander and step into that suitcase. So that's what we set out to do. That was a very that was a sketch that I had done whilst being on that call, without seeing any assets. I mean, it's a suitcase; it's not very difficult. But you know, without seeing any assets, without kind of knowing anything about it, and from there we kind of progressed pretty quickly. And that's the thing with VR: it's taking the simplest thing, but once you're in a virtual experience, you are essentially blinding the user for a given period of time. So all your other senses are heightened. We often try to throw everything we can at it, but actually, it's the simple things done well that have the best impact. So we worked pretty fast. These were some of the very early concept sketches that we got our artists to do. Again, we hadn't even received any of the shot sets. We didn't know what the sets looked like. It was just doing, do, visualizing a VR experience is probably one of the most difficult things to do. You are asking someone to take a huge leap of faith, especially if they haven't even tried VR. A lot of the execs at Warner's hadn't done this, even talking to Rowling's team. They hadn't, they're not necessarily VR natives. So we did a lot, of mood, a lot of mood boarding and a lot of concepting about how it would make you feel, the atmosphere. But what we do very early on is we begin to prototype. We gray box prototype from day one. We tend not to do storyboards because being in VR, it's something that you have, you has to be experienced. Doing little prototypes like this enable us to one, share with the client very quickly, one, share with the team very quickly and assess whether something is going to work. This was one of the first things that the teams had seen, and it got us kind of moving along in the project pretty fast. Now, we took LiDAR scans from the, s from the set. Luckily, Christian and the team were smart enough and wise enough to take LiDAR scans of everything, every piece of the set. We took all of that, and we used that to our advantage. Everything was very meticulously, you know, we, we, we painstakingly recreated everything that they were shooting. Some of these sets were only up for hours. So we had to use continuity shots, we had to use photographs from the on-set team. The detail in the VR experience, we then create, recreated everything in 3D. And now one of the great things about these experiences, we wanted to give people the ability to interact with objects. What they were going to interact with, we didn't quite know yet. So from day one, we built everything in a way that should I want to reach out for a potion bottle on the shelf, I had the ability to do that. Having the high level of detail was essential in this. And we worked in the Unity engine, we worked with the visual effects team on set, and then we had our visual effects team in the studio. Now these were people that had worked on movies like Gravity, movies like The Martian, movies like Guardians of the Galaxy. So we took all of their skill sets and applied it to this medium. We give you the freedom to explore multiple scenarios. So in the film, you can either be in the New York apartment, Tina's New York apartment, you can be in Newt Scamander's shed, or you can be in one of three environments with three of the beasts. We recreated all of these to high fidelity and high detail. And the idea is that you've, it felt so believable. It felt, felt so believable that you just stepped into a suitcase and immersed into this magical world. And then what tied the narrative together is that thinking about what purpose do you have in this experience? one of the things about VR is if you're inviting me, you're not, you're not the audience, you're not a participant, you are a visitor into a virtual world. What role do I have? And establishing your role is really key. So we worked with Rowling's team to establish that Newt Scamander, who is the wizard, is away on urgent business, another one of his beasts has escaped, so he needs a little help from you guys. So he wants you to help keep an eye on some of these creatures while he's out. So we've established that you're not quite the wizard the level of maybe new, but you're definitely one in training. And so throughout the experience, you do a number of challenges. One, to increase your wizarding skills, and two, we'll reward you with interaction with three of the beasts. So the story's established, 
There's gameplay elements into it to really draw you in. And then Newt Scamander, so Eddie Raymond's voice, guides you. Now, the guiding of the voice was something that we was very key. So it's not, uh, he's not there as a narrator. He's not narrating a story. It's not children's bedtime. He's actually there guiding you through the gameplay. So it's a mixture of storytelling, narration, and directional gameplay, something that we hadn't played with before. So how do we, <laughs> how do we design for a platform? when we don't even have the platform in our hands. And this was one of the toughest challenges, but we worked very closely and collaboratively with the Google Daydream team. We were working in parallel to them launching the Daydream headset. This was actually a very early, we were using the Google Cardboard when we were using a phone to emulate what, what would eventually be the Google Daydream controller. That's one of our producers trying to figure it out. We would have day, we had daily reviews and we worked in a very iterative process. A lot of the challenges that we were faced with, we really worked with Google to help work out, was it, was it us? Was it what we were doing in Unity? Was it what we were doing with our code? Or was it actually the hardware itself? And it's that kind of play between working on something that is still infinitely new and then trying to solve the problems around that. Again, within the experience, we prototyped very early on. This is an example of some of the scrolls that we used, this is an example of some of the assets and elements. What we found earlier on is that we couldn't, because it was on a mobile phone device, I wanted every single object in that shed. I wanted you to be able to pick it up, go under, pull open the drawers. But because it was on a mobile phone, we were restricted. That's one of the hardest things to deal with as a creative or even as a team. So we had to make some tough decisions. What things added value to the story and what things added value to the experience? So are there are a number of objects that you can interact with. Uh, probably, we ended up with probably about 12, 12 objects within the experience before we actually broke the phone. And then we had to scale back. So you interact with a series of objects. And then they were all meticulously placed into the experience. So the way we did the experience is that you are in an environment, in each environment, you are, there are objects that you can interact with in real time. We created a number of spell gestures, unique spell gestures for this experience. So within the Rowling world, and anyone who's a Rowling fan will probably know there's a gazillion spells, and I was so excited to use all of them until we were told, you're not allowed to lose any of them, Rash. So I, okay. So we had to create all new spell gestures. That spell gesture was entirely made up. And we were having a lot of fun with it until we got the controller and realized half of the spell gestures we came up with, the controller couldn't facilitate. Because we were being wizards and we were doing crosses. And eventually we realized that's never going to work. So we had to simplify the spell gestures. So testing and iterating as we went along was crucial to us kind of getting to a point where there was gameplay, but it wasn't too hard. So remember, the audience for this is not gamers. You know, I'm a gamer by heart, but I'm not the audience. This aud the audience is families, mums, dads, grandparents, kids. So they had to be able to pick it up and intuitively play with it. So what did we do from a gameplay point of view? Each of the three beasts that we have, you have the ability to do a challenge. And each of the challenge, the narrative around the challenge is related to the beast. In this challenge, you have to pull together a music box, a very simple puzzle. And once the music box is pulled together, you then use it to summon the Thunderbird that you then go out and meet. The challenges in the experience are very simple, but again, it makes you feel like a wizard. It makes you feel like you've achieved something. And we had little prompts, and we, we, we had the classic doing cheats. If someone really couldn't get it, we just kind of made it happen and then nudged them along in the story. So there's ways to make them feel like they've done something and they've been rewarded for that. And again, here's an example of that music box, a native Indian music box that you use to summon the Thunderbird. And then also one of the other uh, challenges that you have is one of the beasts has a terrible cold and you have to mix a potion for him. So again, as I said, there were unique spell gestures created. There were unique puzzles created, three in the end. And as you completed each one, you were rewarded with meeting one of the fantastic beasts. So how do, how do we maintain the visual quality all on a mobile phone? This was one of our toughest challenges. And ultimately, what we did is we had to build feather systems. We had to build completely different rigs for our characters. We did use the creatures and the models that were being made for the movie, but they had to be customized for VR. 
bear in mind, anything that's produced for a film is going to be for infinitely better quality than anything that we do for a mobile phone. So the creatures had to be adapted, the animations had to be adapted, and we had to think really hard about how do we make these creatures really feel believable, especially when they are so precious to the author, and the story, and the narrative. So we worked on making, from day one, we worked on making their animations and the things that they did with you believable. We had to bring out their personalities. Now, this is, a cre this is not a creature that you can go and see in Bristol Zoo. This is a creature all made up in Rowling's mind. We had to work out what their personalities were and draw them out. In this instance, this Graphorn has a cold, so he sneezes all over you. And the idea of this thing, this huge beast hovering above you and sneezing, kind of makes it more enduring. You feel like you want to take care of him. So that potion you just mixed, you give him a little bit of that potion and he feels infinitely better. And then you can interact with the beasts. So you can feed them and you can take care of them. And by giving that interaction, we actually made people feel so much closer to part of Rowling's world. We did something that the movie didn't do. We placed you right on set. We gave you the ability to be a wizard but we also brought you up close and personal with each of the beasts. And in the movie, you get a tiny two to three second glimpse of them. So one of the challenges and one of the toughest challenges was how close could I get this beast to me in VR? And it was something that I would <laughs> argue with the developers about daily. This is the Arumpan. Now, she kind of looks scary, but actually her personality is she's kind of a big lovable puppy. Um, and she's looking for somebody to love. Um, now, one of the things with her is, in the environment, I wanted her to be as close to you as possible. And we played around with this multiple times. For me, getting her so close that people leant back, almost as if they felt her horn was going to hit you. And one session when we were reviewing the content, developers got so annoyed with me saying, how close can I get the rampant? They shoved her right up into my face. Um, and then I said, yeah, I think we should push her back a little bit. So we get her right up, and she comes right up close, giving you a good old sniff. Now, the quality at which we delivered this app was impressive. And the way we did it is we cheated in the sense that the background is a 360 and the rumpant is a video card. And the, w and that, the way we had to do that is she is pre-rendered. We couldn't have her in real time because it just wouldn't work on the phone. So all of the creatures are pre-rendered as video cards, and then you are in real time in the game engine. And that's what VR is about now. It's about finding, finding the ways to deliver the best things that you can with all the tricks and all the techniques that you have hidden up your sleeve. And then this is the Thunderbird. And for some reason, JK Rowling's Thunderbird is called Frank. Obviously, that's what you would call a Thunderbird. Now, when the, when the visual effects creature team said to me, there were, there were over 20 beasts in Rowling's world, and when, they said, when I said to the team, okay, we're gonna have to render three of the beasts, tell me which ones you guys think are the best ones to do. They said, Rash, stay away from anything with feathers and fur and wings. And so obviously, Warners and Rowling chose a six-winged Thunderbird to do. And the fact that the team pulled this off is just testament to the fact that everybody who's working in VR right now wants to try and do something that gives you guys, the audience, the visitors, something that they've never had before. Um, we built complete feather systems to enable us to do this. Um, the Thunderbird comes in and he is hovering above you. And what's really great is he's a little bit package, so you get to feed him this great old bug. Um, what was interesting is when we were doing the VO session, Eddie Raymond, we are doing a second series of this with a further three beasts. And Eddie Raymond came to the recording session, popped the VR headset on his head, and he came out of it and he said, oh, I have to get myself one of these. This is really good. And I was like, what do you mean, Eddie? And he's like, well, when I'm filming, I never actually see the beasts. I only see puppets on a stick. So this is the first time I've really actually seen them, and I feel like I've been up close to them. <gasps> wipe away my tears, I do. And I was like, I never even fathomed, I never thought about that. That actually we brought you as the audience, as a visitor into this world, closer than even the actors have. And it felt really real, he felt that affection with them. Now there were a number of different challenges and one of the, one of the funniest challenges I'll leave you with is, when we got the Daydream controller, to me it was like, this is a godsend, this is easy. The controller itself is, is intuitively a wand, so when you put, the headset on, it becomes a wand. Now in the narration, when we wrote the first few scripts, then the Eddie says, take your wand, point and click. Naturally, that's what you would do. It went to review and Rowling's team came back and said, so Rash, uh, Rowling's got a couple of changes. What are the changes? Well, wizards don't click. <laughs> so 
there are things like that, that you have to stay true to the magical world, and yet there's that tension between, but people need to click. So, you know, we found ways around that and we took it out, but it's just kind of, it's just kind of being, it's still keeping you in that virtual world and making you believe, no matter what, that you are a wizard was our goal. Now, we've learned a lot of lessons, we've done a lot of VR projects, but there are some things that I want you guys to take away with you. No one in VR is an expert. And anyone who tells you that they are is lying because we're still learning. We're still in the early days of VR. We're still in the kind of the silent movie era. We haven't reached the talkies yet. And it's all about learning and sharing everything you can so that something, some things that I've heard in talks earlier, I'm going to apply them to the next project I do. And hopefully some of the things that you've heard in mind, you will apply to yours. But think about VR in this way. That VR is a user-first medium, which means if I am the visitor in your experience, Put me first, not your brand message, not what you think would be cool to do in VR. Put the user first. In putting the user first, a lot of what we originally pitched came out of that experience. And play to the strengths of the medium. So if you are developing for a mobile phone, think about the fact that you are developing for a mobile VR experience. Or if you are developing for Gear VR or HTC Vive in its room scale, play to the strengths of those controllers and the haptics. And test your ideas early and often. Because no matter w what anyone says, I have never pitched anything in VR today that has been the thing that I've delivered at the end of it. And that is the exciting journey. And then collaboration. So you heard me say collaboration multiple times throughout those three challenges that I talked about. Collaborate with your team. VR is pulling skill sets together that traditionally were kept apart. Our team worked together to conceive the idea, pitch the idea, and then deliver the idea. And when you collaborate, and you have a diverse team of individuals with different backgrounds. Everybody from the runner to the CEO can be involved in the project, but you get better results because everybody looks at the virtual world differently. And then think about why does your experience exist? What is it here to do? Is it here to educate, enlighten, bring joy? Is it here to take you and transport you into Rowling's world? And if it can exist with purpose and meaning, then You've got the golden chalice of creating VR. You've created a VR experience that has presence and is unforgettable. And that's what we're trying to do, create experiences that are unforgettable. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was absolutely fantastic.